Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'd like to begin by reading some passages that Dr. Smith asked me to read from. So first we're going to read from Exodus 35, beginning at verse 1. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, purple, blue, and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breast piece. Let every skilled craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hooks and its frames, its bars, its pillars and its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense with its poles and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle, and the pegs of the court, and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women. All who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands, and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece, and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil. And for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a freewill offering to the Lord. And then also we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness... For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, 
and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So far. May I lead you in prayer. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in your grace you give us this evening where we can come together and we can hear a presentation from Dr. Smith regarding the work at the Theological College and also one of the topics that he has studied in some depth. Father, we thank you for the service done by these men at the Theological College and we pray that you would bless their work. We pray that you would bless us as we receive some of the fruits of their work this evening Give to Dr. Smith what he needs to present well, and so that we may be built up by it. Father, will you overrule all human weakness, and will you guide us in all things by your Spirit? We ask this all for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. So it is my privilege this evening to introduce to you Dr. Smith. Now, Dr. Smith was... The first person I had the privilege of hearing preach when I moved to Hamilton back in the summer of 2011. And I distinctly recall that he preached a sermon on Psalm 148. And after hearing that sermon, my first thought was, wow, I get to learn from this guy. From there, I sure did learn a lot. Everything from Egyptians to Hittites to the staff of Moses. Yes, there were three lectures just on the staff of Moses. And one thing I also learned very quickly in first year, and this was in Hebrew class, you can't have straight A's. And that referred to Hebrew vowels, but at that point we realized that it was a broader meaning as well because there was no way straight A's were possible in first year of seminary. Dr. Smith has been serving as the professor of Old Testament at our seminary since 2010, and before that he served five years in pastoral ministry at the Free Reformed Church of Albany. Dr. Smith, we thank you for coming out this evening. He's going to first talk about some work that's being done at the Theological College, and then after that he's going to give a 35 or so minute talk on the tabernacle, which is why we read those passages earlier. Following those two talks, there will be a question and answer period. So yes, you will get answers tonight to your questions, hopefully. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for coming. Let's give him a warm Nearlandia welcome. Now, seriously, if you'd like to come forward, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to make it clear. I was supposed to come here a few years ago already, but uh, COVID happened and other things happened, and uh, I finally ran out of excuses, and here, <laughs> here I am. Uh, 
So there's the, a little bit of the city of Hamilton, which is where the uh, seminary is. Hamilton's a city of about half a million people or so. And, um, and the seminary has been located there from the very beginning when it started uh, in, back in 1969. Uh, the very first seminary building was in uh, the lower part of Hamilton. I just looked it up on Google Maps and it's still there. It looks pretty much the same as it did back in the 1970s. Uh, except maybe a little older and a little bit more run down. Anyway, in the early 1980s, it moved, the seminary was moved uh, up the mountain, as they say, to its uh, present location. And uh, we've, we've been there ever since. As everyone who moves to Hamilton discovers, uh, it's not a mountain. What's called the Hamilton Mountain is an extension of the Niagara Escarpment that kind of divides the upper part of the city from the lower part of, of Hamilton. So the seminary is now in the uh, uptown area. Here you can see the front of the seminary, and uh, here you can see the back. Um, as you probably are aware there have been a lot of renovations at the seminary over the course of the past year. The outside of the building hasn't really changed at all uh, because we weren't able to increase the footprint of the building, but a lot uh, was changed in, uh, in the inside. So while these renovations were going on, we actually used a neighboring church for the past year. This is the Maranatha Free Reformed Church in uh, Ancaster, a beautiful building. And these people were very kind in lending us their building and allowing us to hold our seminary classes uh, there this past year. One of the students who was in his fourth year said, in the past four years, we haven't had a normal year of seminary education when you put together COVID and renovations. I said to him, you have an excuse if things don't go well in the ministry. They also have a, a beautiful pipe organ in this building, and uh, we were allowed to use that as well, which is very nice. Uh, back to our actual building. Uh, this room is the chapel room upstairs. Uh, every week, we begin the week with a time of worship, and on Fridays, we end the week with a time of worship as well, and that's, um, uh, that's held in this room in the, in the chapel. This is also where we hold what we call our sermon sessions. Uh, this is where students learn to preach their first sermons. So every Wednesday we hold sermon sessions here. One of the students goes up, delivers a practice sermon, and then the professor goes up and tells him what he could do better. And, and so we learn. Uh, during COVID, of course, we all had to practice social distancing. And we also had to make provision for online learning. So you see a screen at the back there with, if you can hardly see it, some little uh, Zoom um, boxes on the screen as well. So we had to make provision for online learning. And just like everywhere else, there were a few times during the COVID period where we had to shut down the seminary altogether. And as profs, we had to teach by Zoom from home to students who were learning from home. So this is me teaching in the front foyer of my house with a big pad of paper uh, nailed to the wall in the front of my house. And we kind of made it work. Uh, here you see a picture of some of the renovations. And if you've been in the seminary before, this is where you won't recognize it at all. So a lot of things uh, happened. Um, Walls came down, the kitchen was completely redone, uh, new bathrooms were put in, the flooring and, and everything about the place looks completely di uh, different. It's much more open concept now than it was before. And we had to do this because our student numbers have been growing. We had smaller classrooms there before and those smaller classrooms became useless because um, we had too many students for them. So we had a number of smaller rooms that were sitting empty and unused so it just made sense to knock down some walls and to open things up, and that's what's happened. Um, also, because it was becoming an older building, the wiring had to be redone as well, the furnace, uh, the duct work, and so on. So quite a bit of uh, work went into this over the course of the past year. 
Um, as is true in the building trades generally, we experienced that it, it went a lot slower than we expected. We thought that we would get the building permits last year in the spring, and then the goal was to do all the renovations over the summer and get them done by September. That didn't happen. Um, we got the building permits last September, and then it took the better part of the school year to get the renovations done. And it's the regular thing, supply chain issues, trying to get workers in, trying to get the trades to do, to, to, to do the job. But thankfully now it is just about finished. In fact, the city inspector was in the building uh, just the other day to give the initial okay, and there's a few final inspections that have to be done, but basically the work is done. This is the new senior classroom, and for those who have, of you who have seen the building before, that used to be the old freshman classroom plus the ping pong room plus part of the student lounge. Recognize it, Gerard? It's a ping pong table. No, it's gone. Well, they've become a little narrower. <laughs> yeah. So there's room in there now for 35 students, which is um, more than what we need, but will hopefully do, it, do us for some time. Um, it's actually a really well-lit room. Uh, this, uh, the uh, screens are down in front of the windows, but there's actually a lot of daylight that comes into there. Um, it's also um, high-tech with the latest audiovisual technology, which makes it possible for us to teach students who are joining classes online from anywhere in the world. And that holds promise, particularly for students for whom it's hard to come to Hamilton to study because of personal circumstances. So this is the senior classroom, and what that means is that the students who are in that class are in their second, third, and fourth year of seminary, all together in one room. Um, so the way we do it is we have one classroom for the first year students, they're all together, and then another classroom for the second, third, and fourth year students, and then we teach those courses on a three-year rotation. That's why we need a big senior classroom and a much smaller first year classroom, which is this one. But it's also sizable, um, and uh, there's lots of room for growth there as well for the students. I've only got one little picture of the library, but it's actually quite a substantial uh, part of the building. It's uh, two floors all together, and there are about 40,000 books or so, and they're all related to biblical subjects, um, studying anything related to the Bible in any way. The way the library is supported every year is through the Women's Savings Action. There are representatives in congregations across the country, and they collect money from their local congregations. And then at the September convocation evening, uh, the Women's Savings Action presents a check uh, to the seminary that helps to buy books and journals and whatever is needed for the following year. So the seminary is very appreciative of this work that's done by a lot of volunteers and also for the gifts that come from the congregations. Okay, how many students do we have? Um, that's pretty hard to read. Okay, I'll, I'll help you out. Uh, so this past year, we had our biggest class ever. We had 34 students. Um, to put it in perspective, when I started teaching in 2010, we had 14 students altogether. So it's gone from 14 to 34. That's why the renovations had to happen, you see. And uh, we're thankful for this because the Federation of Churches is, of course, growing too. I think we're currently growing as Federation at a rate of more than one new church per year. So currently, I think we have close to 70 congregations. And as you know, here in Alberta, vacancies keep happening too for one reason or another. And so it's important that we uh, continue to have students studying theology, preparing for pastoral ministry. Uh, next year, the student body is going to be a little bit smaller again, down to 28 students. But overall, the uh, trajectory of growth is upwards.
Uh, here's a picture of the current student body uh, together with faculty and a few staff members. So as you can see, it's quite a crowd. And then you add in the fact that most of them are married with young families, and that's the size of the crowd you get. Three times a year we get together for a barbecue or a potluck dinner so that we can uh, get to know each other um, a bit more personally. There's also really close bonds among the students and their families. They're all going through the same thing. They're all in the same stage of life. They're, the students are taking the same courses together, so very close bonds are formed among the students during their time at seminary. Uh, besides their teaching in the classroom, the students also get uh, field experience by means of the pastoral training program, and that especially happens during the summer months. After their first year of, of study, uh, students have uh, what's called an orientation week, sometimes two weeks, where they basically shadow a pastor. They go to a pastor and they follow him around for a week and try to do some of the work that he does and uh, get exposed to what the daily life of a minister is like. Um, then after they receive preaching consent, either at the end of their second or at the end of their third year, uh, students do a full summer internship uh, with an existing congregation. Some of you have had that in your congregations where a student comes out and spends the summer with you, uh, preaching, attending uh, consistory meetings, going on pastoral visits, uh, really getting immersed in what the life of a pastor is all about. Then in addition to that, there's also something called a mission internship, um, where a student will go to a, a mission field, either one in Canada or perhaps in the States, or sometimes uh, further away. Uh, here's a very recent shot of uh, Quentin Vandermeulen, seminary student from Carmen, Manitoba, who's learning what life in Papua New Guinea is like. Uh, there's five professors at the seminary. Uh, the latest addition is Dr. Ruben Bredenhoff. Uh, he's going to be our new professor of ministry and mission. He was just appointed by our last synod. And so he is going to be uh, teaching some of the more practical courses of uh, ministry, such as preaching, catechism teaching, going on pastoral visits, counseling, as well as um, mission and evangelism. Dr. Den Hollander is the professor of New Testament. He took over from uh, Dr. Jerry Vischer, who retired th three years ago. And uh, he's also our dean of students. He's, uh, he's the young one of the profs and was a student not so long ago himself and has a, a great rapport with the students. Uh, Dr. De Visser has just taught his last classes, so he actually turned 65 a couple of months ago, and that's why Dr. Bradenhoff was appointed to take his place. He has kindly agreed to stay on on a part-time basis for the coming year. Um, he has, for many years already, directed the um, pastoral training program, and that's quite a bit of work. He uh, Basically, what he does is he teams up the students with different ministers, whether it be for mission or for their summer internships. So there's a lot of coordination that goes into that. I teach Old Testament. Part of that is also teaching Hebrew, which is quite a bit of fun. As you can see, it looks a little different than English. It, it runs from right to left, which is really nice, I understand, for left-handed people. You know how when you're left-handed and you write, your hand always blots the ink and makes a big smudge? Learn Hebrew. <laughs> you no longer have that problem. Uh, Dr. Van Ralty uh, is the professor of ecclesiology, which means that he teaches church history and church order, especially, as well as a few other subjects. You might remember that a couple of years ago he had a very serious uh, snowmobiling accident. Uh, which uh, left him with a very serious head injury. I'm thankful to say that he has made a very good recovery from that. 
I think it would be too much to say that he has, he's doing 100%, but he is able to take up all his teaching duties again, and we're really thankful for that. And then Dr. Van Vliet is our uh, principal currently, and he is also the professor of uh, church doctrine, which means that he teaches the confessions and the doctrines of scripture. Uh, besides the props, we have three staff members who help with the administration as well as uh, running the library. The highlight of every year is the uh, annual convocation uh, where the Board of Governors and the faculty and the graduating students all meet together for uh, kind of a graduation evening. Uh, this is the current Board of Governors. The six gentlemen in the, in the middle are all ministers, and so they oversee the actual education, the training that takes place. And then on the outsides there, you have five uh, other gentlemen who help especially to take care of the finance and property of the seminary. Uh, there you have the regalia. It's the one time a year where I get to wear a dress. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually a very old tradition that um, professors um, dress up. Apparently in the old days, they, they wore these things every day. Uh, we don't. <laughs> we really don't. And I'm glad we don't. But we do for graduation yet. And the reason for the different colors, by the way, is the colors are the colors of the institution that you got your doctorate degree from. So mine, with the uh, black and, and red there, is the colors of the University of Toronto. So if you're ever considering doctoral studies, make sure you check what, what colors you're going to end up with be, before you apply there. Uh, we've got a great website, so if you want to find out more about what seminary is all about, and this is especially for people who are considering the ministry or considering theological studies, there's a lot of information on the website about what kind of studies you have to do to get there and what the process is like for um, entering uh, the ministry and entering seminary studies. It's also really good for people who are thinking about this to actually get in touch with us at the seminary and to let us know because we do quite a bit of work uh, communicating with prospective students to let them know, and it helps us as well to know who's coming down the pipe. There's also a lot of just news and information there about uh, life at the seminary. We had our 50th anniversary just a few years ago, so the seminary, thanks to God's grace and providence, has been in existence for uh, 50 years. Um, we're really thankful for that, and we pray that the Lord will continue to bless the work that's being done there. A few years ago, in case you're interested, a book was published. You might remember that. It's a book called Your Word is Our Light, celebrating 50 years of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. It's got a, a ton of historical information, as well as a lot of uh, older pictures and so on. And a lot of that is the history of the Canadian Reformed Churches as a federation as well. It's still available. I checked Amazon.ca, and you can still get it there. That's it for the seminary update. Let me just uh, take a moment to switch over my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, we just talked about the renovations at the seminary. Now we're going to talk about a different kind of construction project. Oh, it's not working, is it? Is it?
Perfect. Thanks. All right. I, I'd like you. Uh, I'd like to talk with you about the building of the tabernacle. Uh, as you remember, this happened in the book of Exodus. As the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness, they came to Mount Sinai, and there the Lord commanded that a tabernacle be built. Now, this is one of those parts of Scripture that make for somewhat tedious reading. Um, Reverend Verinka reads very well, but you can't change the fact that it does make for some rather tedious reading. It doesn't actually sound very exciting to read all kinds of lengthy descriptions of how long, how wide this was, what this was for, and so on. And that's what these chapters are like. What you might not think, but is actually true, is that the building of the tabernacle is actually the climax of the Exodus story. And I'll explain what I mean by that. When you think about the storyline of the Exodus, the people have been delivered from bondage in Egypt. The Lord has brought them across the Red Sea and to Mount Sinai, and he's spoken to them in a voice of thunder from the top of Mount Sinai, and then he calls Moses up to the top of the mountain and gives him the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. Then you have the sin of the golden calf where the people waiting down below decide that Moses is gone for good and they're going to worship a golden calf instead. After that whole episode, the building of the tabernacle takes place. Now, when you read those chapters, as I said, they, they make for some somewhat laborious and tedious reading. However, at the very end of that account, God himself comes down from Mount Sinai and takes up residence in the tabernacle. So this is actually the climax of the Exodus story. The Lord who has been going with his people and who has rescued them from Egypt now comes to dwell in the midst of his people. He lives with them, his tent, in the middle of all their tents. It's actually spectacular. So with all of this, what I'd like to show you is some of the gospel in um, these tabernacle description accounts and how uh, we can uh, gain great comfort into the message of God's grace. Uh, in the book of Exodus, we actually have two sections about the building of the tabernacle. Um, first, there are the instructions for how to build it. And those instructions were given to Moses, as I said, at the top of Mount Sinai. And then at the end of the book comes the actual description of how they built it. And basically, it's the same thing all over it again. Chapter after chapter of details and so on. Now, why do we have all of this information twice? Well, it has to do with the way that the book of Exodus is set up as a whole. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but I'll try to explain it for you. Um, six times we have God appearing to his people. When you think it through, the book of Exodus could have been a lot shorter. God could have simply given the instructions to Moses with all the details that time, and then the story could have ended with, and Moses went down and did exactly what God told him, period. But it doesn't happen that way. Instead, all the details come back. And that is what I'm trying to show you has to do with the way that the book of Exodus uh, is set up. The book has an alternating sequence. God appears to his people, and then come a number of stories, and then uh, those stories lead to another appearance again. So you have some introductory stories at the beginning, then God appears at the burning bush. Then you have the stories of how God delivered his people. Then God appears at the Red Sea. Then come some more stories of how the people start traveling through the wilderness. Then God appears and gives the law at Mount Sinai. Then you have a story about how the covenant is ratified. Then God appears again and gives Moses the instructions for the tabernacle. Then you have the golden calf story. Now once again, God appears. And at first, he destroys some of the people for their sin. But then 
on Moses pleading, he renews the covenant. Then you have stories again of how the tabernacle was actually built, and then finally God appears in the tabernacle. So you've got this alternating sequence between stories and God appearing. Now what I'd like you to think about is where we find the two tabernacle building accounts. The first one is found in chapters 25 through 31 over here. And that's right after the, uh, the covenant has been ratified the first time with God's people. Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders go up the mountain. They see God and they eat and drink. The second time is when the tabernacle is actually built and the backdrop for that is the golden calf story. So when you think about the fact that the golden calf story appears right in between, there's something quite striking here. A lot of the gold which God had just told Moses was supposed to be used for building the tabernacle gets used for the golden calf instead. Aaron, who's supposed to have become the high priest, according to God's instructions, leads the people in the sin of the golden calf. Moses has to plead with God not to destroy the people and has to plead with him still to go with them to the promised land. So what I find amazing here is not just that the tabernacle still gets built, but that the plans actually stay exactly the same. Detail for detail, item for item, dimension for dimension. It all gets built to plan. The tablets still get put in the ark. Aaron still gets to be the high priest, almost as if the whole golden calf story never happened. That's amazing grace. That's a testimony to invincible grace. Human sin and rebellion cannot derail God's plans to dwell with his people. So that, I think, is the point of why all those details get re, uh, uh, told again a second time to show that God's plan does not change. Okay, let's now get into some of the details. Reading these chapters is a bit like reading a, a construction report, not the most exciting reading at face value. It also has some of the characteristics of a construction report. First, you get the time schedule. The people are told to remember the Sabbath. Then you get a request for materials. You need to gather the materials to actually build it. Then you have the designated craftsmen. Bezalel and Oholiab are set aside as the craftsmen in charge of uh, putting the tabernacle furnishings together. Then you get an itemized building report. Each item gets built to specifications. Then the paperwork has to get done. You get a chapter that records the amount of materials that were actually used. Then you get a report from the textile, de textile department uh, about how the priestly garments were put together. Then you get the inspection. When the items are completed, they're all brought before Moses and he inspects them to make sure that they've all been done to spec. And then finally, the tabernacle is set up and completed. And finally, what we would call moving day happens. The Lord comes into uh, the tabernacle. The glory cloud descends upon uh, the tabernacle. God moves into his new tent. That's the overall structure of how it's put together, exactly as you would expect uh, a construction account to happen. Uh, let me just mention a few things here. First of all, about the time schedule. Um, in the chapter that Reverend Verink read, you might have noticed the reference to the Sabbath day. It starts with the Sabbath day. Uh, having an important project to work on, even a project for the Lord, a project that's as, as important as building the tabernacle, does not exempt people from Sabbath obedience. Grace does not cancel out obedience. In fact, the Lord was very strict here. He said uh, that Sabbath was a capital crime. They were forbidden even to light a fire in their tents and in the context of building the tabernacle, that, that means not only can you not 
uh, cook the manna for your meal. Um, but it also means that they were not able to do any of the metal work that they would have had to do in order to build the various artifacts of the tabernacle. Then a comment about the collection of the materials. Uh, Moses gave the people a quick summary, a list of all the things that had to be built and of the sorts of materials that they would have to bring. But the people were not assessed. They were not commanded to give a particular amount. It was a free will offering. So that means that the opulence of the tabernacle, just how rich it was going to be, would depend on the generosity of the people. And so we learn from this that God is not a self-serving king who places heavy burdens on the people or who builds his house on the backs of slaves. He's not like Pharaoh. He's redeemed them from slavery. He treats them as his children and he makes their burdens light. God wants willing hearts and thankful faith. And the people gave so generously that they had to be told to stop. I'd like you to notice especially the reference uh, to the women in that chapter. They're mentioned uh, separately alongside the men. The women gave of their personal belongings that they had acquired in Egypt. Now you might remember that back in Exodus 3, the Lord had said, every woman has to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. And maybe the most delightful example of this is found in Exodus 38, verse 8, where we read that the bronze basin, that big water vat in the outer courtyard, was made from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Back then, they didn't have glass mirrors. Uh, they used bronze instead, polished bronze. I can assure you that women in ancient times used mirrors for exactly the same purpose that women use them today. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Royal Ontario Museum in, in Toronto. And there, in the section on ancient Egypt, uh, we saw a model of a woman putting her makeup on. So what makes the donation of these bronze mirrors so striking is precisely the fact that these were women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting, it says. In the context of the ancient Near East, there were many pagan temples, and often in these pagan temples, women would serve as temple prostitutes but not in the Lord's tabernacle. So here we have actually, in that sense too, a countercultural tabernacle, a place where the serving women give their mirrors away voluntarily. That may very well have been the greatest sacrifice of all. I also find it remarkable that the Lord allows his people to be his co-workers. God reveals the plans, but the people supply the materials, the people all pitch in and they help with the work building the house of the Lord using the gifts that he has given to them. After all, they are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I want to move on now to some of the um, parts of the tabernacle and I have a number of slides to help us to be able to picture these various parts. I want to make two quick comments about these slides. Uh, the first comment, is, it's maybe just good to say, there's nothing inherently wrong with uh, making or showing pictures of what the tabernacle might have looked like. They're not images of God. They're created things that people could make and see. But the second comment is important as well, and that is this, that there is some subjectivity and probably inaccuracy in these pictures. Yes, we have a lot of detail in scripture about what these things look like, but the Bible doesn't tell us everything. So for an artist to reconstruct this does take some imagination. So pictures can help, but only um, God's word is inspired and reliable. First then, we have the tabernacle proper. 
basically a large tent, 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, uh, divided into two rooms. You've got the holy place in the front and the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, in the back. Uh, the Holy of Holies in the back is uh, 15 by 15 feet wide and long and also 15 feet high. So it's basically a cube, that section at the back. And the holy place, the front two-thirds, is uh, twice as long. Um, it's uh, 30 feet long and, again, 15 feet wide and high. Uh, the tent had two curtains. Uh, the first curtain was the entrance right across the front over here. Uh, through which the priests could come into the holy place. And it had, this curtain had blue, purple, and scarlet embroidery on it. Again, what that embroidery exactly looked like, we don't know. Uh, there's no mention of cherubim on that curtain. Uh, the second curtain was the inner curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. So that would be inside there somewhere. And that one did have a cherubim embroidered on it. Now you also see on the picture that the tent has four layers. Uh, the inside layer was uh, finely twisted linen, uh, which was a very high grade linen that was worn by nobility, probably a bright white in color, as you see. Um, the three colors that are mentioned next, the blue, the purple, and the scarlet, are actually the names of uh, three dyes uh, that produce those colors, uh, listed in order from the most expensive to the least expensive. Uh, the first one, the blue, is made from snails that are found in the Mediterranean Sea. It was very expensive, worn only by royalty. And these were the dyes then from these snails that were used to color the yarn that was then used to embroider the cherubim onto the linen. And that's just the first layer. The second layer was made of goat hair, which was quite a common material that people used for making tents. And then the third layer was of ram skins that were dyed red and sewn together, so it would have been a reddish color. So this was a durable uh, leather covering. And then besides all of that, yet yeah, there was still an outer layer. And we're not sure exactly what that is made of. Translations differ there. It was the skins of dolphins or perhaps another sea creature such as a dugong or a manatee. So what we get from all of this is that the tent was very strong and also very durable. It was waterproof so it could withstand the elements and uh, it could last a long time. And it did last a long time. Uh, first the 40 years in the wilderness, and then after the conquest of Canaan, it was set up in Shiloh. It stayed in Shiloh throughout that tumultuous time of the judges until the time of Samuel. And then you remember the stories of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas the town of Shiloh at that time was, was actually destroyed. And it seems that the tabernacle did survive, but it was moved to a place called Nob. Nob is where David fled from Saul when he asked for bread from the high priest. So that's a different place. So the tabernacle had moved. Later on, it moved again. In the time of Solomon, we read that um, the tabernacle was located in Gibeon. Now, once Solomon's temple was built, then we read that the cloud of the Lord came upon the temple in Jerusalem. And so then the tabernacle was not needed anymore, and we don't hear about it again either. But altogether, the tabernacle would have been in use for about 500 years. That's even longer than Solomon's temple was in use. And even in the New Testament, uh, the tabernacle remains important for the faith of God's people. We read that passage from Hebrews 9, when the author of Hebrews describes what Jesus came to do for us, 
He doesn't use Solomon's temple as an illustration, but he talks about the tabernacle as a copy and a shadow of heaven. He says that in the Old Testament, the high priest went through the second curtain into the most holy place once a year, but always went with blood every year again, which shows that the real cleansing of our consciences from sin did not happen. But when Christ came, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is, through heaven itself. Christ has entered the most holy place with his own blood. And he has stayed there, truly cleansing our consciences. And when he comes out again, it will be to give us full and complete salvation. So thinking about the tabernacle in that sense helps us to gain perspective on what Christ has done for us and what Christ is still doing for us. In the Old Testament, the high priest was only allowed to go uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement into that most holy place. Jesus did that when he ascended into heaven and he has stayed there ever since, making a, a perfect and complete atonement for our sins. Then going back to Exodus, uh, next we get a description of the furniture that had to be placed inside the tabernacle. Uh, the ark had to be placed in the Holy of Holies. And in the holy place you get the table, the lampstand, and the altar of incense. Now here's an artist's reconstruction of the ark. I'm not sure how good it is, but anyway... Um, that's the, the slide that we have. Uh, the ark was the most sacred object in the tabernacle, so it's the one that's described first. Now the word for ark in Hebrew simply means a chest or a box. It's a, a different Hebrew word, by the way, than the one for, for Noah's ark. The two have nothing to do with each other. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant represents the very throne of God. And it would contain the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments, which was the, the, the covenant that God made with his people. And then on top of the Ark was an atonement cover or a mercy seat where the high priest would sprinkle the blood uh, once per year. You can't really see it, but it would be right in there. And then mounted over the mercy seat were two cherubim with their wings overshadowing the covering and they're looking down towards uh, the ark, towards the mercy seat. Their faces are turned downwards, it says in the Bible. And that's a striking little detail. When you think about the function of cherubim in scripture, they're often on guard. So you would expect them maybe to be looking outward. Watch out, don't enter, don't come here. But instead, no, they're looking downwards. So they don't, the message is not keep out, but the message is more one of reverence for the Lord. Now cherubim are fearsome creatures. In the Bible, we always read about cherubim being close to God, close to God's throne. The most vivid description that we have is in Ezekiel chapter 1, and there they are called the four living creatures, each beside one of the wheels of the chariot of the Lord. And there each one had four wings and four faces, a face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Uh, other descriptions in the Bible are a little bit different. For example, in Revelation 4, uh, each of the four has a different face. Now, when we read these uh, kinds of descriptions, they almost sound a little bit like mythology, but not for the people of Bible times. There's actually quite a few images that have been found in the ancient Near East of uh, composite creatures like that. So have a look at the one on the right there. It's got wings like an eagle. It's got a body like a lion. It's got um, a face and hands like a person. Very much like the descriptions of cherubim that we find in scripture. So this is actually uh, an artifact that archeologists have found. 
Contrary to popular imagination, cherubs are not cute and cuddly uh, like the one on the left there. They're a lot more scary like the one on the right. Uh, the ark was where the Lord dwelled, seated between the cherubim, and it was the only piece of furniture in the most holy place. The ark was not allowed to be touched, and that's why poles had to be used uh, to carry it, and those poles had to stay permanently in the rings that were used to carry it. Now, the ark was a place of atonement. It was also... Um, it also had a military function. It was used to lead the people into battle. So the ark went ahead of the people into the Jordan River and the water separated. The ark went around the city of Jericho and when the people shouted, then the walls came tumbling down. Now, of course, this military function of the ark could be misused as it was by Hophni and Phinehas carrying the ark into battle against the Philistines. The ark was not to be taken as some kind of good luck charm or magical gadget that would uh, guarantee victory. God cannot be manipulated like that. He remains sovereign. Now, it might interest you to know that, um, as you recall, Hophni and Phinehas were killed and the Philistines captured the ark. And after that happened... The ark never came back to the tabernacle again. It did come back to the land of Israel, but it was moved around from one place to the next and never found its way back into the tabernacle again. Even when David took it up to Jerusalem, he put it in a new tent that he had built for it. And then from there, it entered uh, Solomon's temple. And that's where it stayed for as long as we know anything about it. Precisely how long the ark survived, we don't really know. The Babylonians eventually captured Jerusalem, and there are a couple of chapters in the Bible that list all the things in the temple that the Babylonians took. The ark's not listed. Which raises a lot of interesting questions. What happened to it? How did it disappear? Where did it go? And both in ancient and in modern times, many legends have arisen about what might have happened to the Ark of the Covenant and whether it perhaps survived. The Bible itself uh, doesn't say. One interesting place in the New Testament yet where the Ark is mentioned is in Revelation chapter 11. At the end of Revelation 11, just before war breaks out in heaven, the ark was seen in the throne room of God, Revelation 11. Very interesting. So I guess that's where it is. Yeah. Uh, the next item to consider is the uh, altar of incense. Um, inside the holy place. But if you read Hebrews 9 really closely... Hebrews 9 seems to say at the beginning that the altar of incense was together with the ark in the most holy place. It's rather curious that Hebrews 9 says it that way because in Exodus it's fairly clear that it was put in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Now this may have something to do with the fact that the altar of incense is located right by the veil. In other words, to get to the ark, you had to go past the altar of incense. And that's in fact what the high priest had to do on the Day of Atonement. He had to take incense from the altar of incense before he went into the most holy place. There are also uh, what are called horns on the corners of the altar, four so-called horns or projections. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything more about those horns or projections, but over here on the right, we have an actual stone altar that archaeologists have uh, dug up. They found this in the city of Megiddo, which is a Canaanite city. So this is actually a pagan altar, but it has these horns on the corners. 
So we know from that that um, horns were more common on the altars back in, the, back in those days, and it gives us some idea of what the horns on the altar of incense in the tabernacle might have looked like as well. What were they for? Well, once a year, the high priest put the blood of the atoning sacrifice on the horns of the altar. So that was part of the ceremony for the Day of Atonement. Uh, one more thing that the Bible teaches about the incense offering, the incense offering on this golden altar represented the prayers of God's people. Think of Psalm 141, O oh, let my prayers like incense be. So the incense smoke going both up from the incense altar and probably through the veil into the most holy place represented the prayers of God's people coming before God himself. Then the other two items in the holy place were the lampstand on the south and the table of showbread on the north. And by the way, I should mention that directions are very important. Uh, the tabernacle and later the temple did not just face any old way, uh, however the people happened to set up camp. No, the entrance was always on the east, and it was the only entrance. And that's a setup that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where the Lord placed the cherubim on the east side to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So that's where the entrance to the garden was. So in the tabernacle as well, people approach God from the east, moving towards the west, where the Lord is seated. Now when you think that through, then that means that the Lord dwelling in the ark is facing eastwards which means that God's right hand is pointing south. It may interest you to know that the Hebrew word for right hand means south. Right and south are the same. The temple also faced east. Now, why do I say this? Well, when Solomon built his palace next to the temple, he actually built his palace directly south of the temple. And now think of Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Well, the kings in David's line actually did so because their palace was on the right hand or the south side of the temple. The kings in David's line did sit on their thrones on God's right hand. Now, of course, they didn't sit right beside God. They were not able to be in the most holy place. They were sitting some distance away in a house of their own. But the imagery is certainly there. And so they foreshadowed what Christ now does as the son of David when he sits at God's right hand except Christ sits much closer. He sits right at God's right hand in the heavenly temple because he is our priest king. And the Israelites would have understood those kinds of connections far better than we do because they knew the lay of the land. They actually lived there. They saw how things worked. Okay, back to the, the holy place. On the south side, as I mentioned, you, you have the um, lampstand. Uh, we don't know how tall it was. We only know how heavy it was, about 75 pounds of solid gold hammered out into a lampstand from a single lump of gold um, with a central shaft and, and three branches on the side. Let me see if I've got a separate picture of that. Yeah, here it is. Uh, one thing perhaps to keep in mind is that there's a difference between the lamp stand, which is what this thing is, and the actual lamps. Uh, we should not think, by the way, that oil ran through these branches to, to shine a light up there. That's not how it worked. Um, we shouldn't think that these blossoms that were built on there were actually lit. 
Uh, that would not work, and the reason why is because burning olive oil is hot enough to melt gold. So that would be a problem. So uh, the lamps were actually made separate from the lamp stand. Scripture does say that much. Scripture doesn't say what they were made of, but they were probably made of clay, because typically lamps were made of clay in those, ti in those times. Uh, the lamps had to be turned in such a way that the space in front of the lamp stand was lit up, and the high priest had to light the lamps in the evening and had to make uh, sure that the lamps did not go out until the morning. And by the way, that may explain another little detail in Scripture about Samuel. It might explain why the boy Samuel was inside the tabernacle when God called him. But Samuel, of course, is, is not a high priest. He's not a, a member of the high priestly line. So you would not expect that Samuel would be allowed to spend the night in the holy place. However, as the passage mentions, um, Eli was nearly blind. It would make it a little difficult for him to tend the lamps. And that then was probably Samuel's job under Eli's direction as an apprentice of sorts, as an assistant. The law was very clear that the lamps had to be kept burning from evening till morning. Why? Again, the Bible doesn't say in so many words, but the basic message seems to be that through the activity of the high priest, the way to God is always lit up. The path to God is never dark. Furthermore, uh, some have pointed out that when you look at the, the shape of the thing, it reminds you a little bit of a tree, maybe the, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And if that's the case, then perhaps it represents the spiritual life of God's people shining before God. Certainly when you read Revelation chapter 1, Christ walks among the seven lampstands, which represents the seven churches. And there are also seven spirits in Revelation, one per church. So it may be that the shining light then represents the spiritual life of God's people. Then on the north side, we have the table of showbread. It too was made of pure gold, and it had carrying poles inserted into the rings at the four corners. Uh, Leviticus 24 tells us that 12 loaves were put on the table each week. There's the loaves there. Uh, one loaf per tribe of Israel. Now, in pagan temples... Uh, pagan priests would put out food for the god and they would go through a ritual by which they pretended to feed the god. Uh, some scholars have, have, have suggested that that's the case here in the tabernacle as well, uh, but that's foreign to what the Bible teaches. God doesn't need priests to feed him. And also notice that the bread never goes into the Holy of Holies. The Bible actually suggests a different explanation you might remember how in Exodus 24, Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders went up the mountain and they saw God and they ate and drank. In behalf of the people, they had a fellowship meal. Now, in the tabernacle, such a fellowship meal could be held every week. The priests represent the people who are a kingdom of priests. Now, then we might be tempted to wonder, is this a, uh, a foreshadowing of what we have in Lord's Supper today? Well, we have to be a bit careful with the connections that we make. Uh, the people did not eat the bread. It was just the priests. And the priests were not allowed to eat the bread when it was sitting on the table, but they could only eat it after it had been removed, after its week on the table. I wondered about this, and I remembered that Professor Hochus, one of my profs at the seminary, had once uh, preached a sermon about the table of showbread. He apparently preached a whole series of sermons just on the various elements of the, the tabernacle. And uh, uh, his wife uh, shared that sermon with me, and, and he said... 
that the point of the table is that it represents the finished products of what the people could make. In other words, the people grow grain, they bake the grain into bread, and then the bread goes on the table before the Lord. And then the message, said Dr. Hochus, is that God delights in the finished products of his people, still today. God takes pleasure in what his people have done with his gifts, and he allows his people to put their, their, uh, the works of their hands on display before him. And then the message is that we can still bring our daily work before the Lord because he takes pleasure in what we do with the gifts that he has given to us. Okay, then the outer court. Let's have a quick look at that. Here is, um, I mentioned the water basin, the bronze laver made from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The Bible doesn't tell us very much about it except to say that it was put somewhere in the front of the entrance of the tent so that before the priests could go into the holy place, they first had to wash their hands and their feet with water. Makes sense when you think about it. Um, these priests were constantly handling blood, body parts, ashes, oil, flour. You get the picture, they could get pretty messy. And they had to be clean before they came into the presence of the Lord. And it reminds me also of um, at Mount Sinai, when the people came there, the people first had to wash themselves before they received the Ten Commandments. Then the main item in the outer court is the altar of uh, burnt offering, located just inside the entrance. It was square, about seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, about four and a half feet high, something like that. It was made of acacia wood overlaid with bronze. And if you looked inside the altar, then about halfway up it, there was a, a bronze grating on which the offerings were actually laid. And underneath that grating, the altar was hollow. Now, people have puzzled about this. A bronze grating like that, would that be strong enough to hold the weight of a cow if you put a cow on it? Wouldn't it fall apart? Some have suggested maybe they held it up by putting earth underneath. Uh, because in Exodus 21, the people were told that when they built altars, they had to use earth. So maybe the bronze altar is a frame that's placed on a mound of dirt. We're not really sure. I won't get into the different kinds of offerings that were sacrificed. Uh, there's so much information in scripture about this. Um, I can simply say that this altar would have received an awful lot of use. It was the busiest part of the tabernacle where the people came with their offerings and uh, they saw the priests and the Levites going about their work. This was where they handed over their crops and their animals and they watched as the priests took the blood and the oil and the bread into the holy place. And it was in this area that the people were allowed to pray as well, in the outer court. One example of that is Hannah, who prayed for a son. It was also where people could come for refuge and take hold of the horns of the altar. Yes, the altar of burnt offering also had horns on its corners. And scripture does tell us a little bit more about these. Maybe they were used to tie down the offering. However, that doesn't really seem necessary. Um, but um, they were used as a place of refuge. Uh, think of Joab. Solomon condemned Joab to death. Joab fled into the, into the tent and... Um, took hold of the horns of the altar. So that means then that the altar of burnt offering is a place where both the justice and the mercy of God is manifest. Justice in showing the need for blood to pay for sin. Mercy in allowing his people to offer uh, a sacrifice as a substitute and also being able to come for refuge 
by those horns. Okay, in closing, I, I want to say just a few words about the curtains that surround the outer court. It was a big courtyard, about 75 feet wide, 150 feet long, made out of 11 curtains that were clasped together, and they were held up by a whole bunch of frames and bases. And the only entrance was on the east side, right there. Big entrance, about 30 feet wide. Now these curtains were about six feet tall. And what that means is that it's too high to step over, but it's also too high for most people, certainly in those days, to even look over. What does it mean? Well, God had come to dwell in the midst of his people, living in a tent, just like his people did, traveling with them on the way to the promised land. That's a beautiful picture. But God could not simply walk about with them the way that he walked about with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God needed space, sacred space. Space that the people had to respect and that they could only enter on his terms. And the curtains then create that space, forming a wall around the sacred space. The people could not see over the walls, they couldn't see into the tent, but they could see the pillar of cloud, which had come to settle there. They knew that God was there, he was really there, so close by, and yet still a distance away. An accessible God, yes, but also a holy God who was not to be trifled with. And the only way to approach God was through the entrance. And there stood the altar, with its countless offerings, and the people could not go any further than that. And yet they could offer sacrifices. They could trust that their sins were forgiven. They were allowed to have fellowship with God. They were allowed to be in the courts of God's house. They were allowed to sing and praise and pray and celebrate inside the courts of the Lord. They were a kingdom of priests and God had real covenant fellowship with them. But it was a restricted fellowship with so many rules and so many barriers. And if those rules were broken or the barriers were disrespected, then the people could expect disaster. Yes, God traveled alongside his people for a while and he led them to the promised land, but a much better day still had to come when the Lord himself would tabernacle with his people in the person of his son, Jesus Christ and also a time when we may, in Christ, be temples of the Holy Spirit, be united by faith with Christ, who is in the Holy of Holies at God's right hand. And so you see, too, that in Christ, God has come much further with us than he did with his people Israel in the Old Testament. And even our time is not yet the best. The best is when Christ returns and faith becomes sight, Sin is forever gone, and we will enjoy life in the new Jerusalem. And I want to say just two things about the new Jerusalem. Thing one is this. The new Jerusalem is in the shape of a cube. You read that in Revelation. Just like the Holy of Holies was. Except now the whole city is that shape. And we will be inside and thing two is there will be no temple there. Have you ever wondered why when Christ returns there will be new heavens and a new earth? A new earth we can understand. But why new heavens? Well, heaven as it exists today is still a temple. It's a beautiful temple, yes. And it's a temple where there's no more place anymore for Satan to accuse us, but it's still a temple with incense, and a high priest, and intercession. 
When Christ returns, there will be no more need for intercession, so heaven itself can be made new. And so in the new Jerusalem, there will be no temple anymore because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. And we will be able to see God face to face and enjoy a life that we cannot even begin to imagine. That's it. Now is uh, the time Dr. Smith's been waiting for. We had a chat about that this afternoon. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, take advantage of this opportunity and I'll bring you the mic so that everyone can hear the question. Who can I give the floor to first? Thank you. I was wondering, were any of the materials from the tabernacle used in the temple, like the curtains and, and um, I know I think the, the altar might have been, but were any of the other materials used in the actual temple? Um, let me think a minute. Uh, the ark, of course, right? That's the obvious one. The ark went uh, into um, the temple as well. Um, not the lampstand. We read that Solomon actually made quite a number of lampstands, 10 if I remember correctly. And I think that the other artifacts were remade as well. Yeah, why that is exactly, scripture doesn't say. Um, but for the most part, I, I think that those were new artifacts that went into the temple. And maybe it stands to reason when you consider that the tabernacle by then was over 500 years old already. wait till he was at your place, eh? How many times was uh, it moved during uh, the time in the desert? Oh, in the desert? That's a good question. Um, yeah, yeah, there were. Yeah. We don't. We don't know exactly how many times. Um, if, you, if you look at num Numbers 33, it talks about all the places that they stopped at, and it's a long, long list. Now, whether they actually took the tabernacle down and set it up each time, I, I have my doubts, particularly during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Um, there was a lot of wandering that happened during that time, and you get the impression that on many of those occasions the tabernacle was not set up because they were simply in transit. But the Bible often doesn't say. So in the wilderness itself, we know that they did it. They did dismantle it and they moved on. Uh, in fact, the Lord gave specific in instructions for what they had to do and who had to do what and who had to carry what uh, and so on. So we know that it happened. How often, we don't know. And then I, I'm not sure if you asked also about after they settled in Canaan. Um, Shiloh was the first permanent place where they set it up, and it stayed there for a long time, um, even when uh, from, from Joshua all the way to the time of Samuel. So throughout the time of Judges, then it would have been there. And then, as I mentioned, um, the ark was captured, never came back. The tabernacle at a certain point moved to Nob, which is, we think, further south probably. It's, uh, we're, we're not sure exactly where Nob was. And then Gibeon, which is just to the north of Jerusalem, and, and that was the final place. So at least a few times then as well. Which begs the question, why? And um, you can answer that next. And I know you're an Old Testament, the Old Testament prof, so I might be uh, stretching here, but um, but present day, like so the 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 um, temple ra was ra razed to the ground in 70 A.D. and um, now there's a golden dome there. Are you able to talk about present day, the temple, um, and and any of these artifacts present day? They were carried off or reused, or but do do we know where 
where these things are present day? A short answer is no, we don't. Um, so when the Romans uh, destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, uh, they raided what was left of the temple in, in that time and destroyed it again completely as well. There is actually an, an, an image um, of the lampstand being carried off to Rome. In fact, it's a very striking image and people think it's quite authentic because it, it looks exactly like a Jewish lampstand. So we know for sure that the Romans carted off the lampstand. What exactly happened to it? We don't really know. As for what's under the Dome of the Rock, get in line, there's a lot of people that would love to know what's underneath that one. And uh, yeah, um, the day is not coming anytime soon when archeologists will be allowed to do some serious digging there. Yeah, they're for some reason very protective of that place. Yeah, so yeah. Um, but how much would be found is, is another question of course. Um, even before the Dome of the Rock was, was built there, um, all that would have been there would have been temple ruins and very little in the way of artifacts. So maybe they'd be able to dig there and find something of what the structure looked like, but it'd be very doubtful that they would find any um, valuable artifacts there. Wasn't the big uh, part of the purpose of the temple and Jerusalem and so being destroyed so that the people had to focus on the new covenant, like it says in uh, Hebrews, what is old and vanishing away, and had to bring in the new so those people couldn't even go back there to, to serve the way they did in the Old Testament times. Yeah, and that's always good to keep in mind. Um, as much as it might be interesting to dig underneath the Dome of the Rock for archaeological reasons to find something about the history, if we're going there to find a message of the gospel or to, to center our religion there again, that would be misguided because God doesn't want us to do that anymore. Um, in, in fact, uh, the Lord Jesus, when he spoke in Matthew 24 about the destruction that was coming when one, not one stone would be left upon another, um, he indicated that that was also God's judgment upon that place and it had to do with the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus didn't stay in the earthly temple. He turned his back on it and, um, and he is now in heaven, where, which is where he should be worshiped. Yeah, so it's good that we keep it in that perspective. It's one thing to have historical curiosities about things, but it's something else to let our faith be informed by it. Yeah. Feel free to also ask questions about CRTS itself. I'm not sure if you would know this, but how do modern practicing Jews then explain that there's no longer an earthly temple? Would you happen to know anything about that? How would modern Jews explain that there's no longer? They don't believe in the Jewish resurrection. Yeah. So then how do they explain that there's no longer a place for God? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that the Jews, at least the Messianic Jews, are still hoping that something will be restored in Jerusalem one day and that a new temple will be built there. In fact, some of them will interpret the last chapters of Ezekiel that way. So if you read the end of the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has visions of, of a new temple that is being built upon a, a high mountain and all kinds of measurements and so on are given of that. So for some Jews then, that's a, a prophecy that still remains to be fulfilled and hopefully will be one day. Yeah. Anybody else? Just a real simple question. Did they ever clean the Holy of Holies? Holies. Okay. Yeah. The, the Holy of Holies itself probably wouldn't have needed very much cleaning because it was only entered into once, once a year uh, when some blood was put um, on, on the ark. But besides that, it would have stayed clean there. As far as the rest of the tabernacle is concerned, though, the Day of Atonement actually 
provided an opportunity for a bit of a reset, and they did some, some cleaning and some purification on the Day of Atonement itself. That was kind of a, a reset for the new uh, ritual calendar year that would follow. So that was built into the Levitical laws. Um, how much of that would have been done in the Holy of Holies, though, Scripture doesn't say. Anybody else? So if my memory serves me correctly, there was an instance in Exodus where God said that he would no longer dwell with men, and so he the, the tabernacle was actually outside of the camp, was a, as a ways away from um, where the people lived. Is that correct? Is there uh, any kind of any comments on that? Or? Uh, that's from Exodus 33. If you look at verse 7, it says there, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off uh, from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Now this is right after the sin of the golden calf, and it's before the tabernacle is built. So this is a different tent, and Moses, for a time there, uh, would take that tent pitch it outside the camp and, and uh, call it the tent of meeting, and then Moses would go there to meet with God. Now this was right in the time, uh, as you mentioned, that God said that he no longer wanted to go with the people. And um, Moses again pleads with the Lord that he will go with them anyway, and then the Lord allows um, Moses to see his back and, and he says in Exodus 34 verse 6 the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and so on and so there then the Lord in the rest of that chapter um, renews the covenant and agrees to go with the people anyway and then following that the tabernacle is in fact built does that answer it? Yeah, it's always a bit tricky to comment on why things don't happen, right? Yeah, but I, I think that the answer is, is this. Um, when the second temple is built after the return from exile, that's only the beginning of the restoration that God would bring. So, um, for example, when you read a lot of the prophets, for instance, the prophet Isaiah, they foretell that when the exile is over, uh, the, the people will return to the promised land and there will be a great renewal of all things, a messianic age, and, and the whole earth will be restored. And in the prophets, all of those things are put together very close. The way it actually plays out in history, it takes much longer than that. So what I mean to say with this is that uh, the actual rebuilding of the second temple is only part one of the process of restoration. It needs for Christ to come. And then, so I, I think that the, perhaps the best way to look at that and see an answer for that is to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Um, Uh, John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father. The word that's rather tamely translated in the ESV as dwelt among us actually says tabernacled among us. Yeah, so that's the point. So what didn't happen in the return from the exile yet does happen when Christ himself comes to tabernacle on the earth. Yeah, and then that really puts in perspective Christ in his ministry how often he was in the temple courts. So there you have. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Christ coming in the New Testament then is the fuller fulfillment of, of, what, uh, of what you have in an initial way in the Old Testament. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? So about the seminary, when they, uh, it seems to be that this um, mission, uh, they, they go off to mission for a number of weeks at the end of, say, year three or so. That seems new. I haven't heard that before. And does the student, um, how much does the student have to uh, input into where they go? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it used to, it, it's been for a long time already part of the pastoral training program. It used to be standard that it would happen after year two. And then after year three, they would get preaching consent and then do their full summer internship. Uh, a senator or two ago, I think two senators ago now, the decision was made that students could already ask to preach after year two. Um, and then the, the way we, we do things is if they do decide to do it after year two, then they'll do their full summer internship then and do their mission internship after year three. Uh, but regardless, every student does have a mission internship in their seminary training. Um, it might be a little bit more low-key than the summer internship is because we don't see it as much in our churches. It's, a, it's an individual thing that they do. As far as who goes where, often that's a matter of personal discussion between the student and Dr. DeVisser or with, his, with, um, with uh, one of the professors. Sometimes it depends on personal circumstances of the student because you will have some student, uh, you know, they have a wife and children, larger family, so they're not going to go off to Papua New Guinea or something like that. They're going to find something a little bit closer to home. Um, or sometimes uh, you will um, see something that just could be a really good fit. Let's say you see that a student could really benefit from a particular kind of exposure. It would really help their training to be exposed to something completely different, then we'll try to pair them up that way. And sometimes it just depends on what's available. It also depends on expenses a little bit um, in terms of financial resources. Uh, the summer internship is, uh, is paid for by the churches, especially the churches that host them, uh, but the mission internships are not, at least not currently. So then it depends on what the student is able to do or whether he's able to get some financial backing from family or other means um, to do uh, something a bit more grand, yeah. Who else? Going once. Twice, you're off the hook. Pretty painless, wasn't it? Evening. <laughs> I, I, I said to Gerard earlier, number one, you never know what's coming. And number two, you never know what's behind the question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that presentation, also for taking the questions. Can we uh, express our gratitude to Dr. Smith once again? Can I lead you in closing prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the riches of your word and that already back in the wilderness as you led your people out of slavery, you presented them with the gospel of how you would dwell among them, but that you would do so on your terms, making it clear that you are a holy God, that you are not to be trifled with. And we thank you that through your son, Jesus Christ, we have access to you and that we can come to you in prayer and look forward also to living with you eternally in all things. Father, we thank you that the riches of your word could also be open for us this evening by Dr. Smith, and that you've given us men with these capabilities. We pray that you would bless him as he continues in his tour here in Alberta, give him safe travels also as he returns home to Ontario. Father, will you bless him, bless the other professors as they are already preparing for the new season of instruction in September. Give them also a blessed time of refreshment this summer and grant that their efforts would receive your blessing. Be with the students at the seminary, whatever levels they are at, whatever internships they are busy with. 
Father, will you bless their efforts and cause them to continue growing so that your churches may continue to be blessed with faithful ministers of the gospel. We also pray for the staff who labors at the college. Give them also what they need to carry out their task that things may continue to run smoothly there. Father, will you bless this institution? We thank you for the work that it has done over the years. And we pray that it may continue to be a blessing for the churches, both here and abroad. We ask for your blessing as we now go our separate ways. Keep us safe on the road. Forgive that which was sinful in your sight. And help us to prepare rightly as we look forward to gathering together with your people tomorrow for a day of worship. Will you look upon us in grace and deal kindly with us through your son, Jesus Christ. In his name alone we pray. Amen. Thank you all again for coming out this evening. Organized refreshments, so...